It really is good to be here today and good to see all of you here. Um, We're just going to pray that God's going to bless us and open our hearts today to understand what he has to say to us through through his word. If you remember last week in the aftermath of um, Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton, last week we talked about why life-threatening storms happen. Why is it that these storms occur? And we talked about the fact that before Noah's flood, there were no storms. Because when God went through those six days of reconstruction in the book of Genesis, one of the things that he did was he put water up above the atmosphere and water below the atmosphere. That water up above the atmosphere was like a big bubble, a big canopy of water surrounding the earth. When the sun's rays shone through that, they were refracted, and the whole planet was like a big greenhouse. In fact, it had never rained before Noah's flood. We, can, we read about that, how that a mist came up from the surface of the ground and watered the whole surface of the earth. And so we talked about how different the weather was then than it is now. And then during Noah's flood, there were three sources of water that flooded the earth. There was underground water that gushed up and then God opened the windows of heaven and let all of that water that was up above the atmosphere come crashing down. And then for the first time, the sun was shining directly on the surface of the earth, unfiltered, unrefracted, and the water cycle started. And so suddenly there was the evaporation of all this water going up into the clouds and cooling and condensing. And for the very first time, 40 days and 40 nights of rain. That should help you understand the magnitude of Noah's faith. God said it's going to rain. That's not hard for us to believe. But in Noah's day, it had never rained before. And God told him it was going to rain, and that was going to be a part of the flooding of the earth. And he just believed God. Isn't it incredible how life is when you just believe God? Just read what he says in his word and just believe it. That's incredible. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the fact that now that we do live in an environment where there are life-threatening storms, what is God doing with all that? You know, God never lets anything touch us. He never lets anything happen to anybody on planet Earth that he does not have a purpose behind. And so we're going to talk about God's purposes in the storms. And we're going to begin in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, the last part of that verse. Nahum was an Old Testament prophet. You might not have ever heard of him unless you're in the Bible Institute and you took Old Testament survey and you had to read through all that. Nahum was one of those prophets that you very seldom hear anything about. But this is what Nahum told us. He said, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. Well, if it means uh, the Lord has his way, what does that mean? God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. God's got something he wants to do in the whirlwind. I think we could safely call that a tornado and in the storm, whatever kind of storm it may be. Let's pray and ask God to help us understand what Nahum was saying. So Tyler, would you lead our prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us all to be here today. We ask that you open our hearts to receive this message and to be able to understand it and be able to put it forth in our life as we continue on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> God's purposes in the storm, and I want to give you four or five reasons, four or five purposes for, for which God allows storms to occur in the lives of his people. First of all, sometimes God allows storms to show us the level of our faith. Have you ever thought you didn't have enough faith to face something and then when it came you did have enough faith? Or maybe sometimes you thought I had plenty of faith to handle this and then you fell on your face because you didn't have enough faith. You ever been there? God sometimes uses storms to show us the real level of our faith. And here's why I say that. After feeding the 5,000, you remember Jesus worked that miracle, took a few loaves of bread and a few fish and fed 5,000 people with it. After after he did that, um, Matthew wrote this. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. That's to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, when evening came, he was alone there because he had sent them ahead in the boat. So he's alone. 
But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So a sudden windstorm broke out on the sea. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! They thought it was an evil spirit. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. What's he saying there? Calm down, fellas. Cheer up. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Does Peter's personality kind of bleed out there? Peter was an impetuous, take charge kind of guy that didn't always think through what he said. Are some of us that way? I'm not sure that Peter really was prepared to step out of that boat and step on the water, but he did it. He was very impetuous. And, and, and so uh, he said, this is, the Lord said to him, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I like this story. This story is often used to uh, teach people about the low level of Peter's faith. And his faith did slide when he was out there on the water. But I want you to think about this. Of the 12 of them that were in the boat, Peter was the only one that had nerve enough to get out of the boat. He was the only one that had enough faith to walk on water. And he did walk on water for a few steps. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him, and he said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? How did he address Peter? Oh, you of little faith. Your faith was big enough to get you out of the boat and get you a few steps on the water, but when you got your eyes off of me and onto the prevailing circumstances, your faith took a nosedive. You began to sink, O oh, ye of little faith. So you see, in the midst of the storm, Jesus gave Peter the opportunity to see up close and in living color in dire circumstances the true level of his faith. Often, the true level of our faith is not revealed to us until we're in some really desperate circumstances. You ever been there? Desperate circumstances. And then you can see that you had more faith than you thought you did, or you didn't have as much faith as you thought you did. Either way, you're better off if you get a true read on the level of your faith. Okay, now let's look at this. Sometimes God allows storms so his people can see the power of his son. God, God loves Jesus. He's his only begotten son, his only actual biological son. All of us may be children of God through the new birth, a spiritual birth, but Jesus was the biological son of God through the virgin birth. And he loves him. You like to brag on your kids? Let's be honest. How many of you like to brag on your kids? God likes to brag on his too. He likes for everybody to see the power of his son. Matthew wrote this story about another storm that illustrates the fact that sometimes God uses storms so his people can see the power of his son. This is what Matthew wrote in Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27. It says, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. This is evidently not the same storm that we just read about because in that one the disciples were in the boat Jesus wasn't with them and he walked on the water to get out to them in this instance Jesus gets into a boat and the disciples did what followed him isn't that a interesting idea disciples following Jesus isn't that what disciples are supposed to do just follow Jesus just go where he goes, do what he does, you know, just say what he says. And so they did that. The disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea. What's a great tempest? It's a storm. The storm came up on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. You think this might be a life-threatening storm? They're about to be swamped. They're about to sink. They're about to drown. And he was asleep. I love that. Was he worried about the storm? Did the storm trouble him or disturb him in the least? 
He slept right through it. You know, that boat's tossing and turning, and most of us would have been motion sick, and there he is asleep in the stern of the boat. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing, as if they were having to break the news to him. Did you ever have to break the news about anything to Jesus? No, he knows everything from the beginning to the end. He knew the storm was going to come when he got in the boat and they followed him. He knew when he laid down to take a mid-afternoon nap that that storm was coming. He knew that they were going to panic in the middle of the storm. But God was using this as an opportunity to show those men how powerful Jesus really was because notice what it says. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose. This means he stood up. So he's standing up in the middle of a boat that's being tossed about on a raging sea. So he stood up and he rebuked the winds and the sea. What does it mean to rebuke something? It means to correct it. If you rebuke somebody, it means you're correcting them. You're doing this and you ought not to be doing this. Stop doing this and start doing this. The storm was in a rage. The sea was in turmoil. The waves were crashing into the boat. Jesus stands up and talks to the wind and talks to the sea and tells them, basically, if you were in Arkansas, you'd say, quit it. You know, quit it. You know what that means, right? And that's what he did. He rebuked. The winds and the sea, and then it says, and there was a great calm. Isn't that amazing? Jesus can bring calmness into the storm. If you ever had any storms come into your life, not the literal kind, but the emotional kind, the financial kind, the relational kind, all kinds of storms that come into our lives, when we trust him, he can bring calm into the storm. And look at what happened. So the men marveled. That's his 12 guys in the boat with him. They marveled. What does it mean to marvel? They were just astonished. They were amazed. They were looking around. Now, if you were from Arkansas, you'd probably have your mouth hanging open. Just looking around, thinking, what is happening? And then this is their question. Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him obviously in the midst of this storm jesus disciples were given a glimpse of his power over the elements they had never quite gotten that before he's not only in control of life and death he's not only in control of the lives of people He's not only the dispenser of eternal life. He's not only the healer of those who are physically ill. He had demonstrated that to them again and again. But now he has demonstrated to them that he is in complete control of the weather, of the elements that surround us. They got a fresh glimpse of his power. And sometimes God uses storms to do that, to let us see how powerful Jesus really is. And then here's another one. Sometimes... God allows storms to give his people the opportunity to give a testimony about him to non-believers. Do you get that? Sometimes God allows storms so that we can tell unbelievers about how great our God really is. Uh, we're going to read a story here about how that happened. Uh, a, a, a storm at sea gave the Apostle Paul the opportunity to give unbelievers a powerful testimony about his God. You see, Paul had been arrested at Jerusalem. He had been sent down to Caesarea. He had stayed there in prison for quite a while. He had a trial before two different governors. The second governor um, then ordered him to be shipped down to Rome to stand trial before Caesar because uh, Paul had made that declaration as a Roman citizen. He had the legal right to stand trial before Caesar because he knew the court was stacked against him there in Caesarea. So he, he, he made that claim. He said, you know, I need to, to stand trial before Caesar's court. And so they sent him to Rome. And, and on the way to Rome... They were on the ship out in the Adriatic Sea, and all of a sudden this storm came up. And this is what it says. Luke wrote about it in Acts chapter 27. Some excerpts from verses 14 down to verse 25. This is what he wrote. 
a wind of hurricane force called a northeastern swept down from the island. If it's a wind of hurricane force, what is that? That's somewhere between 75 and 200 miles per hour wind. You know, today we're more sophisticated than this. We, we have uh, stage one hurricane, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. He just said, this is a big one, guys. Hurricane force, this wind came down, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hand. The ship's tackle was the ropes and the pulleys and all that stuff that they would use to turn the sail in the appropriate direction to have some control over where the ship was going. And they threw that overboard. They were desperate. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging. So they're in this storm for days. And it says, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. They are desperate, right? They've given it up. They think we're going to die. You ever been there? But you didn't because you're still here. But that's what they thought. They gave up all hope of being saved. And after they had gone a long time without food... I like this. I've heard people read this before and say, oh, in the midst of the storm, they fasted. Well, they did because fasting is going without food. But I really don't think this was a religious experience. I think this was a nervous stomach experience. They think they're going to die. That ship is being tossed up and down and back and forth. And I think everybody lost their appetite because of the desperation they were experiencing. So they got a long time without food. Paul stood up before them and said, Men, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. What did Paul just have the opportunity to do because of this raging storm? He got the opportunity to tell unbelievers about his God. All these guys had been praying to their own God, which was not the true God. And then Paul stands up and tells him, I've had an angelic vision. A messenger from my God has come to me and told me how this thing is going to play out. Not one of us is going to die. These guys probably looked at him and thought, what an idiot. This is a madman. We're all going to die. If we weren't going to die, we certainly will now because we threw the tackle overboard. I mean, these guys are, they got to be looking at him like this guy is way out on the fringe. But what kind of an impact do you think that testimony made on them when it happened exactly the way Paul's God said it would? You get that? Sometimes God allows storms in our lives to give us the opportunity to be a testimony to unbelievers who need desperately to hear about our God. I want to speak personally to one individual in the crowd today, JJ. You're going through a little storm, buddy, okay? Um, lungs and heart and liver and not kidneys. Your brother offered a kidney. No, you, not kidneys. Um, but you're going through a storm, right? Maybe God's letting that storm come into your life because at the Labonner Hospital, there's somebody who needs to hear about your Jesus. And if God lets you go through this storm... You get to be a testimony for Jesus. Maybe somebody gets saved because of that. And then God gets you back into full steam again. What a testimony. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. He's just too good for the stuff that he does. Okay, now, now here's another one. Sometimes God uses storms to redirect the path that his people have chosen. Sometimes God will bring up a storm just to turn us in a new direction. This particular purpose of God in the storms is clearly illustrated in the, in the Old Testament story of Jonah and the whale. You guys know that story, right? 
Just in case you, some of you may not, we're going to read part of it here in just a minute. In his autobiography, Jonah wrote this. You know, autobiography, because Jonah wrote about his own experience in life. And so Jonah wrote this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But, see if you can relate to this, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish in exactly the opposite direction. God asked Jonah, in fact, God instructed Jonah to go do something Jonah didn't want to do. And so Jonah just chose a different path. Instead of the path to Nineveh, he chose a path away from Nineveh toward Tarshish. Now, you say, well, why in the world didn't Jonah? He's a prophet. Why didn't he want to go there? Let me give you the history behind that. The history is that Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and the Assyrians had conquered the Israelis and brutalized them and enslaved them and mistreated them multiple times during the history of both nations. And so Jonah did not like those people at Nineveh. They were the enemies of his country. So he didn't want to go there and tell them about Jesus, or tell them about God. So he went the other way. And then look what happened. Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, that was on the seacoast, where he found a ship for that port, a ship headed for Tarshish. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now I want to give you this because I think this is interesting and maybe you've had this experience. It cost Jonah something to run away from the Lord. He had to pay a fare. He had to pay a fee to run away from the Lord. How many of you can look back at your life and say, during those times that I ran away from the Lord, it cost me. <laughs> Maybe it cost me dearly. That's what happens, right? It cost Jonah to run away from the Lord, but he's doing it. And then, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. What do we got here? A storm comes up. What happens to the people who are non-believers? They're believing in false gods. Fear grips them, and everybody's crying out to his own God. And then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. Casting lots was throwing stones. They would have, they would have drawn a, uh, somewhere on a flat place in the ship. They would have drawn some squares, and they would have put everybody's name in a different square. They would have had somebody stand away from those squares with their back to it, throw a stone over their shoulder, and whoever's name is the one that the stone landed on, they would have determined that that was the guy who had caused all this. And, and God's incredible. We don't know how many people were on that ship, but enough to, to make a sailing crew, plus Jonah, maybe some other passengers, and everybody's name is listed. And if you don't think God intervenes in the storms of life, whose name did the stone fall on? Jonah's. Because God can guide the stones. How do we know that God could guide a stone? David and Goliath. Did God guide those stones, that stone? When David, a teenage boy, shepherd boy, had that sling and shot that stone toward the giant Goliath, and the only place on the giant's body that, did, that was not covered with armor was a little slit so he could see what he was doing, and God so guided the stone. I don't really think David was that talented. God guided that stone right into that slit, right between that giant's eyes. It sank into his forehead, and the giant fell down dead. David grabbed his stone, went and cut his head off. Who do you think guides stones? God does. And so what we find out here is that, that God can do whatever he wants to do, and he guided the stones when the, when the lot was cast, and, and the lot fell on Jonah. So that's what they did. They said they cast lots and a lot fell on Jonah. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him. They're convinced that Jonah's the problem. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. We don't know how Jonah knew that, but he did, probably because he was a prophet and God had told him. 
If they throw you overboard, I'm going to stop the storm. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. But the Lord provided a great fish, a whale, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I love that. I, I kind of think, because immediately after this, Jonah shows up at Nineveh. So I kind of think that the fish swam to the beach right outside Nineveh and spit him up on the beach. And Jonah got the message. I guess I better change paths. Instead of running away from the Lord and not doing what he tells me to do, I guess I better get on the path he has chosen for me and go to the place where he told me to go and do what he told me to do. And so the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So when God tells you to do something and you say, no, I don't want to do that, and you want to run off in the other direction, is God going to change his mind? No. He told Jonah to go ahead and go anyway. Did Jonah want to go? No. But did God insist that Jonah go anyway? Yes. Now, I want to give you this. Some people try to determine the will of God for their lives. They try to determine whether they're on the right path by whether or not they like that path, by whether or not they're comfortable with that. Is this what I want to do? Can I give you a little, little hint here? God is not in the least concerned about what you want to do. But he is extremely concerned about what he wants you to do. You get that? Jonah didn't want to go. But God kind of orchestrated things that Jonah decided probably be best to go. And he did. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So you see, God obviously used this storm to redirect the path of his rebellious prophet. Let me ask you this. Let's take a survey. I love surveys. You get a lot of surveys on your cell phones these days, don't you? Political surveys, they want to know how you stand about this or that. You realize, now this is a commercial break. You realize, how many of you get those on your cell phone? And down at the bottom, there's always a, a link for you to hit. And it's really not about your opinion. It's really about your money. Because <laughs> they always ask for a donation. But I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Since we're coming up on the election, you might want to realize that. It's not about your opinion. It's about your money. Okay, now let's, let's get this. Let's get this. God used this storm to redirect the path of his rebellious servant. Can God do that for us? Absolutely. Here's the last one. Sometimes God allows storms as judgment for sin. Sometimes God uses storms as a form of judgment for sin. God did so when he rescued his people from Egyptian slavery. Uh, he said this to Moses. This is in Exodus chapter 9, some excerpts from verses 13 down to 25. You know, God brought those, two, those 10 plagues on Egypt because God had raised up Moses to lead his people out of Egypt and go back to the promised land where he was going to make them a great nation. And through them, Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. You see, they had to get back to the promised land so Jesus could be born at the right place. And so God is going to bring them out of Egypt. But the Egyptian Pharaoh decided he didn't want to give up his slave market population because they'd made slaves out of them. He didn't want to give that up. So he wouldn't let them go. And God worked plague after plague after plague after plague and decimated, financially ruined the nation of Egypt. This is an excerpt from that story. This is what God said to Moses. Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go. He keeps saying that over and over again. There was no doubt that Pharaoh knew what God, the God of the Hebrews, wanted him to do. But he didn't believe in the God of the Hebrews, and so he wouldn't do it. Let my people go so they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you. What's he saying there? You think it's been bad so far? 
because this plague is one of the later ones to be worked. He said, you think it's been bad so far, Pharaoh? You ain't seen nothing yet. You're about to see the full force of my plagues. And then look what happened. Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. So the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. Why did God send that storm? Judgment for Pharaoh's sin. He wouldn't let his people go when God gave him a direct order to do that. This was judgment for sin. Now, I want to explain something that you might be thinking, wow. God ruined the wealth, the financial well-being, the health, the future, the plans of all of the Egyptians because of what their leader did? That's exactly right. I got news for you. The election's coming up. And we need to be voting for the person we think God wants to be in office. You say the choices are despicable. Maybe so. Some people don't like Kamala Harris. Some people don't like Donald Trump. Doesn't make any difference what you like or don't like. You got to ask the Lord to show you who he wants in and then just go vote. For that person you get that that's what you got to do i can give you pros and i can take either side i can give you pros and cons of both of them but you got to figure out which one you believe god wants in and go vote for that person for the well-being of the country because if we get the wrong person in and that person is directly opposed to what god wants to the greatest degree then all of us might suffer because of the decisions the leader makes. Right. You get that? that happened here. Pharaoh made the decision not to let him go. Pharaoh's advisor said after one of these plagues, don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? Let him go. And Pharaoh still wouldn't let him go. Do you see that? It's, it's important that we, that we get hold of that. And so sometimes God allows storms as judgment for sin. Now, let's do another little survey. How many of you in your life can look back and say, yeah, some bad things happened, but it was my own doing. I forced God to judge me for sin. Get that? That's just in there. I mean, it's here in the book, and it's, and it's just a real-life thing. So this story in Egypt is a prime example of God using a storm as a form of judgment. I want to, I want to get this. Every storm is not judgment from the Lord. Every storm is not judgment. But some are. And here's the conclusion. We, um, we need not fear the storms, even if they're for judgment. We don't have to fear the storms. As difficult as it may be for us to understand, the truth is that even in the midst of the storm, God is having his way. Even when we can't understand it. And, and his ways are always best. That's where we started with the ancient prophet Nahum. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. In the middle of the storm, the immediate aftermath of the storm, we not be, may not be able to figure out what that is. We may not always be able to understand what God is doing, but we can always trust his heart. He is doing what is best for his people. So whatever God allows is always in some way designed for the good of those who love him. Even when we don't understand his ways, as I said, we can always trust his heart. Paul wrote this in Romans 8, 28. He said, we know that in all things, all things, say that with me, 
all things, including violent, life-threatening storms. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So if we love God, and he's called us for a purpose, and if you belong to him, he has called you for a purpose, then everything that God allows to touch your life is designed for your good. And you might say, well, I can't see anything good coming out of this. That's because he's God and you're not. He can see a lot further down the road than you can. God is always working for the good of those who love him. However, he has also worked for the good of those who don't love him. You get that? He made a tremendous sacrifice for not only people who love him, but for people who don't love him. Jesus explained it like this in John 3, 16. God so loved the world. That's both those who love him and those who don't. Because in the world, aren't there a lot of people who don't love him yet? And may never love him. But he made the sacrifice for them anyway. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, wow, what a tremendous sacrifice, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. They won't die and go to hell, but they'll have eternal life. What an incredible deal. Now, the only way to get the benefit of God's work on your behalf, whether you love him or you don't love him, the only way to get the benefit of the sacrifice that he made, of the, of the good work that he's done on your behalf, is to be rescued from perishing and receive his gift of eternal life. He's already done everything in his power for you to have it, but you've got to be willing to receive it. And you receive it by believing what I call the Jesus story, and the heart of that story is John 3.16 that we just looked at. And since there might be someone here today who has never heard and believed his story, I want to tell it one more time. 